Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic geometry. Today I would like to tell you about um, slightly strange, slightly weird type of equivalence relation that we kind of or people impose on varieties that makes affine and projective space the same. And it goes under the name of a birational map, birational equivalent, birationally equivalent. And what do I mean by slightly obscure? Well, it will be similar to what, if you know what a homeomorphism is, it's kind of similar to that one, kind of a definition that comes up naturally um, from a study of varieties. I will try to motivate it. But then it's also a little bit difficult to control. And in some sense, a lot of things are homeomorphic that are not supposed to be equal, if you want. Um, whatever. And similarly for homotopy equivalence, it's even worse in some sense. And it's somehow similar in the spirit. Uh, so, for example, um, just an example again. So, uh, any knot would be equivalent to a, to, a, to a circle, homeomorphic to a circle. And that's a little bit of a strange thing to do. And the birational uh, gets similar. In particular, it's likely difficult to control. And people are really always looking for invariants under birationality. Um, for example, invariants under homeomorphism would be some kind of a pi one type thing, pi one of a circle, it would be kind of something like this, with integers, and similar invariants are defined or observed for birational maps. In particular, pi one counts as an invariant if you restrict a little bit further. I might comment on that as we go along. But anyway, it comes up naturally, so you're somehow forced to study it anyway. And the good thing about it is it, it kind of identifies two things that are essentially the same in which I was identifying anyway all the time, in some sense, affine and projective space. So let's have a look. So kind of the main thing that you need to know about birational maps is the stereographic projection in my favorite illustration where I have my little north pole, which is a light source, and I have my little, my little plane, let's say the real plane, uh, complex numbers, whatever, uh, kind of complex, complex numbers, whatever you want. And I have my sphere, and there's the, 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 the light source map gives you essentially a bijection between the sphere and um, the plane by just following the light down, right? So the point on the sphere here gets mapped to this point under this direct, the, this point here gets mapped to this point under this bijection. And it's almost a bijection. The only thing that is missing is kind of the North Pole is mapped nowhere. But, but anyway, this kind of identifies affine and projective space because I was trying to convince you that affine space is just this guy here. So this is affine space. And projective space is just a sphere. So projective space. So P and A, maybe. Uh, so this one is A. Projective space and affine space. One of them is a plane, one of them is a sphere, right? You add this point at infinity, the North Pole, and yeah, they're kind, of, they're, they're kind of the same from this perspective. So, birational maps just make that rigorous. And in order to see what's going on, let's have a look at an explicit coordinate way to write down the stereographical projection. I'm very sorry to write down explicit coordinates, but this one is not so difficult. And the only difference is that I shifted the picture so there are many ways to write down a stereographical projection. I like this one, but it's kind of easier in coordinates to shift it. So this is a section of it, such that the North Pole sits at 0, 0, 1 in, in we are, we are, this, as I said, this is a section of it. So we are, we are in three space as on my picture here and the origin of so the, the center of the sphere is at the origin and the kind of the same type of map. And you can identify, except the North Pole, um, the, the sphere and the, the plane, let's say the coordinates of the plane, just X, capital X, capital Y, and the coordinates of the sphere, small x, small y, small z, such that the squares sum up to one. And you can identify them using those types of uh, maps, right? So z equals, one is a bit of a problem because it's our little North Pole here and you can literally see that here in this map. Z equals one is a bit of a sketchy thing here, right? But otherwise, this looks really good. 
And in particular, you can kind of, well, back, go back and forth. So you can check that these are inverses of one another. Okay, fine. So I don't usually don't like to pull up to pull up coordinates, but in this case it's just easy enough, and we will observe something. So let's just look at those maps for a second and observe the following: two observations. It's not a polynomial that gives the stereographical projection, although in algebraic geometry we love polynomials. But it's not quite a polynomial. But it's nothing really difficult, as you can see. It's a rational function. So polynomial divided by polynomial, right? So that's what it is. Uh, as you can see, both in both cases, just a rational function, a polynomial divided by a polynomial. That's not so bad from the viewpoint of algebraic geometry. It's not perfect, it's not a polynomial. We all love polynomials, but it's not so bad. And observation two is, well, it is not defined everywhere. It's the North Pole is a little bit of a problematic point. But it's defined on a very large set, right? essentially just everything except the North Pole. And the idea of birationality is to just use this yeah, to define the equivalence, those both two observations. Rational function and maybe make it defined not quite everywhere, but on something large. Yeah? It's not a polynomial, but it's a rational function. And so define the equivalence relation on varieties works as follows. So rational maps are morphisms, but they are only allowed, they are allowed to be defined on a non-empty open subset of W. No? So a uh, subset of V in this case, and then a map to W. So a rational map between them. And the map is called birational. So it's really a rational map that is exactly as before, it is defined on everything except some little uh Unimportant pieces, we'll comment on the unimportant pieces in a second. So it's a rational, rational map. And a birational map is defined similarly to a homomorphism. It's a rational map with a rational inverse. Yep. Exactly like those two guys here. Those are rational maps with a rational inverse because they invert, invert one another. But they're not quite defined everywhere. Right? It's exactly those guys. And birationally equivalent is just the existence of a rational, birational map. And of course, stereographical projection, that's what we used to, to define birational equivalence, shows that affine space is birationally equivalent to projective space. So this is what we want, so they're equal under birational equivalence. And you might wonder what is actually the crucial condition here. Is it that you have a rational map, so observation one, or that it's not defined everywhere. What is a good color? Maybe this one. So observation two. So observation two on this open. And it turns out that the real condition is a rational map. And the, well, we're doing the risky topology. Not defined. Open sets are just very large. And this is just really means they're defined up to a lower dimensional space, which you potentially miss. Uh, in this example, you just miss. Sorry. In this example, you just miss a point, And in general, you could miss some open subset, but in Tsarisky open subset, it says some uh, closed subset, but in Tsarisky open subsets, it's really large and closed subsets are really small. So kind of the, the crucial condition is the blue one, the rational maps. And that's, that's really a crucial condition because rational maps are, are still algebraic, but they're not as good as polynomials. So they, they actually get really intricate, intricate. They're really difficult in some sense. Um, so iterations will give you fractals. So there's a lot of dynamics going on. And dynamics is beautiful, but algebraic, algebraic geometers usually don't like dynamics, whatever that means. So algebraic is like algebra. So it's a bit strange what's going on here. And birational equivalence identifies a lot of spaces where you think are they really the same varieties. Um, but it does, and just naturally given they're very similar to homeomorphism. And we will definitely use it to blow up points in, in the kind of the next video. But just keep in mind that it's kind of important to have invariance under birationality and pi 1, for example, of uh, a smooth projective variety is an invariant. And you might cry now, wait, 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 wait. Let's go back. The circle is birationally equivalent to the line, if you want. But they have a very different pi. Um, how can that work? Well, one of them, it's really a 
and you need to be careful what you restrict. So Pi1 is an invariant of smooth projective varieties. So one of them is not, uh, uh, so you can jump out of that class and then Pi1 can change. But anyway, so kind of trying to find invariants under birational equivalence is a very crucial topic in birational geometry. It even has a name associated to it. And yeah, for us, the point is it identifies fi space and projective space and will help us to establish kind of this idea of blowing up points and getting rid of singularities. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.